In the late 1950s, the world was obsessed with rockets. The Soviets had launched Sputnik. The Americans were racing to catch up, and every country with a military budget wanted to reach higher, faster, and farther. But hidden behind the headlines of the space race, the United States was secretly building something that didn't look like a rocket at all. It looked like an aircraft, sharp-nosed, jet black, and unlike anything that had ever flown before. They called it the X-15, and at first, most people thought it was just another experimental plane, one of those secret military projects that would never go anywhere. But the world had no idea how wrong it was. Because this machine, this strange black bullet, would end up flying higher than any aircraft before it, touching the very edge of space and rewriting the rules of flight forever. The story of the X-15 begins in 1954, when engineers at MACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the organization that would later become NASA, began to discussing a radical new project. They wanted to build a manned aircraft that could reach speeds and altitudes no jet had ever approached. At the time, supersonic flight was still new territory. The Bell X-1, flown by Chuck Yeager in 1947, had only just broken the sound barrier. But NACA wanted to go far beyond that. They wanted to fly six times the speed of sound and climb past the atmosphere itself. To achieve that, they teamed up with the U.S. Air Force and North American Aviation, the same company that had built the P-51 Mustang and the F-86 Sabre. Together, they began designing what would become the X-15 rocket plane, a machine that would serve as a flying laboratory for the physics of near spaceflight. Unlike normal aircraft, the X-15 wasn't designed to take off on its own. It was too heavy and too fuel-hungry for that. Instead, it would be carried aloft by a massive B-52 bomber, released at 45,000 feet, and then ignite its rocket engine, a Reaction Motors XLR-99, that could produce 57,000 pounds of thrust. In a matter of seconds, it would accelerate past Mach 5, climbing nearly vertically into the upper atmosphere, where the sky turned black and stars became visible in broad daylight. The first X-15 flight took place in June 1959, piloted by Scott Crossfield. It wasn't a space flight, far from it. These early tests were mostly about figuring out how the plane handled, how its rocket engine performed, and how to re-enter the atmosphere safely without tearing the aircraft apart. Crossfield's early missions revealed how brutally difficult that would be. At hypersonic speeds, air behaves less like air and more like a thick fluid. The heat generated by friction could reach 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to melt aluminum. To survive those temperatures, the X-15's entire body was built from a special nickel-chromium alloy called Incanal X, which could withstand the intense thermal loads that ordinary aircraft could never endure. But every new flight pushed the limits further. The test pilots were flying at altitudes where the air was so thin that the control surfaces, rudders, and ailerons stopped working. They had to rely on tiny hydrogen peroxide jets mounted on the nose and wingtips to control the plane's orientation, the same technology used later in space capsules. It was part aircraft, part spacecraft, something completely new. By 1961, the X-15 program was in full swing. Twelve elite pilots would eventually fly the plane, including Neil Armstrong, years before he ever stepped onto the moon. Each mission climbed higher, flew faster, and gathered data that no one had ever collected before. And then came the flight that stunned the world. On August 22, 1963, pilot Joseph A. Walker ignited the rocket engine over Nevada and pointed the nose almost straight up. The X-15 roared skyward, exceeding Mach 5, and moments later, it crossed 354,200 feet, roughly 67 miles above the Earth's surface. That's well beyond the Kármán line.
borderline, the internationally recognized boundary of space. Walker had become, by every definition, an astronaut, years before most of the world even knew his name. He described the view as surreal. Below him, the curvature of the Earth was clear and blue. Above, the sky was pitch black, sprinkled with stars that didn't twinkle. It wasn't just a record, it was proof that a manned aircraft could touch space and come back. Over the course of its nine-year career, the X-15 would complete 199 flights, reaching speeds up to Mach 6.7, that's 4,520 miles per hour, and altitudes no jet or rocket plane would reach again for decades. But flying that high and that fast came with a price. The X-15 wasn't a smooth, predictable aircraft. It was a barely controlled explosion with wings. The pilots knew that one small mistake could destroy the vehicle in seconds. The most infamous example was Flight 191. On November 15, 1967, pilot Major Michael J. Adams, a decorated Air Force officer, was flying at about 266,000 feet when his X-15 began to roll uncontrollably. At those altitudes, there's no atmosphere to stabilize the plane. Instruments began giving conflicting data, and within seconds, the craft started tumbling violently as it re-entered the denser air. At over Mach 5, the aerodynamic forces tore the X-15 apart mid-air. Adams was killed instantly. It was a devastating moment for the program, a grim reminder that pushing the boundaries of flight always carried risk. The remains of the aircraft scattered across the Mojave Desert, and it took investigators months to piece together what had gone wrong. Even in non-fatal flights, damage was common. The X-15 skin often came back scorched, the nose cone cracked, the control surfaces nearly burned through. On one record flight in 1967, pilot Pete Knight flew the modified X-15A-2 at Mach 6.7, faster than any aircraft had ever flown. But the dummy ramjet attached to the underside of the plane caused extreme shockwave interference, and when he landed, the plane's exterior was literally charred and blistered. It had to be retired immediately. The damage was that severe. One of the most interesting controversies surrounding the X-15 isn't just how fast or high it flew, but whether its pilots should be considered astronauts. The U.S. Air Force defines space as any altitude above 50 miles, while the Federation Aeronautical International, or FAI, sets the boundary at 100 kilometers, or about 62 miles. By the Air Force's definition, eight X-15 pilots earned astronaut wings. By the FAI's stricter definition, only two did, Joseph Walker and William Dana. It might sound like a technicality, but at the height of the Cold War, titles mattered. The Soviets had Yuri Gagarin, the Americans had Alan Shepard. But buried in the record books were these test pilots, men who had already crossed into space long before the general public even knew they were doing it. To this day, there's still debate about whether the X-15's achievement achievements should count as part of the space race, because technically, it got there first. What most people never realized was that the X-15 wasn't just about breaking records, it was gathering data, data that would become the foundation of America's manned spaceflight program. Every flight generated telemetry on re-entry physics, aerodynamic heating, life support systems, and reaction control thrusters, all crucial for later missions like like Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. In fact, many of the procedures used by NASA astronauts in the 1960s, including re-entry angles, pressure suit design, and cockpit layouts, were influenced directly by X-15 research. Even the space shuttle, decades later, would owe much of its aerodynamic shape and thermal protection to what engineers learned from the X-15's trials and errors. And yet, the X-15 
scene remained largely in the shadows. It wasn't glamorous like Apollo, and it didn't launch from a Cape Canaveral pad with cheering crowds. Its missions began silently. A bomber releasing a small black airplane over the desert. No countdowns, no live broadcasts, no ticker tape parades. Just a man, a rocket engine, and the edge of the unknown. By 1968, the X-15 program had run its course. The final flight, number 199, marked the end of one of the most ambitious test projects in aviation history. But its influence never disappeared. The data it produced shaped every major space vehicle that followed. The pilots who flew it became national legends in their own right. Names like Neil Armstrong, Joe Engel, and Robert White, all men who would later contribute to the Apollo and shuttle programs. Even today, when aerospace engineers work on hypersonic vehicles or reusable spacecraft, they still reference the X-15's flight logs. Its top speed of Mach 6.7 remains the record for the fastest manned aircraft ever built. Over half a century later, no one has beaten it. And perhaps the most remarkable part? It was done with 1950s technology, slide rules, and raw courage, not computers or advanced materials. The X-15 proved that you didn't need to leave Earth on a rocket to touch space. You could fly there and come back. In the grand story of the space race, the X-15 often gets overlooked, overshadowed by capsules and lunar modules but its legacy runs deeper than most realize. It wasn't just an experiment, it was a bridge between the atmosphere and outer space, between aviation and astronautics. It showed humanity something profound, that space wasn't an unreachable frontier. It was just another altitude waiting to be conquered. When Joseph Walker looked down at the curvature of Earth from 67 miles up, he wasn't orbiting the planet, but he was close enough to see the blackness of infinity. The X-15 wasn't designed to make history History, but it did. It touched the edge of space, and for a brief moment, it reminded the world that sometimes the greatest breakthroughs happen not in the spotlight, but in silence, roaring through the upper atmosphere at the speed of fire.